welcome to the Talent Talks podcast from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I'm Alan Caesar. I'm here today with Ron Fielding at the Prescott campus for October West 2021. Ron is visiting from uh, Boeing. He's an engineer at Boeing Research and Technology and has been there for 30 years. He was formerly on the board of directors at the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute, and he is a former chair of the National Aerospace Standards Committee in the Aircraft Industry Association. He's also an associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He graduated from Embry-Riddle in 1986 with a degree in aeronautical engineering from sort of Daytona Beach by way of Prescott, which we'll get into. Ron, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Now, you've been at Boeing for 30 years now, um, and you, yeah, I imagine you've been an engineer on a ton of different projects. Is there a particular favorite one of yours that really stands out in your memory? There is. When I first started out, I was in a, a group that was doing uh, drones and targets Yeah. Um, unmanned vehicles for uh, the NATO countries. We were testing uh, weapon systems. So we were using uh, targets with instrumentation on on them to uh, test the performance of the weapon system. Okay. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Traveled around the world and got to blow things up. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking drones like we think of as one of these larger scale, uh, you know, not not one of these sort of quadcopters that people play with as toys. Like you're talking a larger scale drone. No, we we had small stuff. We also had large stuff right up to full full-size helicopters that we uh, made into unmanned vehicles to be used as training and targets, which they do to this day. They, they have programs out there to uh, make F-18s, F-16s into unmanned vehicles. They take some of the older uh, aircraft that uh, basically are mothballed down at uh, davis Monthan and, and other oh. facilities, right? And they uh, automate them, and uh, then they use them for live fire exercises. Wow. So, so it, uh, live so it fire, like, it's, it's up in the air being uh, you know, unmanned but then you can still shoot it down then. Yeah, so you can, you know, then, then a squadron of uh, whatever aircraft can come along and uh, and shoot at it or, or, or with their weapon system or whatever they're trying to, to prove or test. So, yeah, it still happens to this day. But back when I was doing that, GPS wasn't uh, common and invented yet. More of a technical challenge to yeah uh, out, of, uh, out from the line of sight um, without GPS. So uh, that I was I was wondering exactly about that. So I imagine that it's all uh, you know radio communications, but you get a little bit of that. You're not trying to bounce a signal off a satellite. You're just trying to transmit directly. Well, most of it was transmit directly. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it was it was a lot more challenging in those days. Now nowadays. I'm sure a lot of the high school students with the with the current GPS <laughs> technology could do twice as good a job as we could do just because of the technology advances. Right, uh, the it, steady it was, march of progress, right? Yeah, <laughs> it was definitely challenging back in the day. Hey, so how did you handle the beyond uh, visual line of sight? Well, I can't get into all the details. Oh, okay. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were using some radar navigation. Um, okay. We were using magnetometers. and What's it, a magnetometer? It's, it's a magnetic uh, heading. Uh, it used to be common in some of the older aircraft before, like I say, the invention of GPS. Even even a lot of your commercial airliners had magnetometer uh, guidance for flying over the Atlantic or Pacific on, on long-haul routes. Okay. So, you uh, know, mag- magnet as in like the Earth's magnetic field, like a yeah. compass. Yeah, so you're, oh, you're okay. taking uh, angular measurements off of uh, the magnetic North Pole and things like that. You have swings in the aircraft, and uh, you have to be able to reset at times. So if you're if in if you're in an old uh, airliner that had mm-hmm. them, uh, they would they would uh, uh, adjust the uh, magnetic setting. Um, Every once in a while, because they would uh, swing or sway off, but uh, in an unmanned vehicle, you can't do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it gets a little more complicated. So. Yeah, and so you'd have uh, targets that had you, know, you said sensors in them, so you could detect how accurate the weapon systems were. Yeah, it's uh, we had uh, we used to call them missed distance indicators. Uh, so uh, we we had boats, helicopters, and planes uh, that would fly in a in a uh, test range. Okay. If you're testing a weapon system, be it a handheld um, missile or a ground launch missile or something, typically the missile would uh, hone in on basically a uh, an electronic signature that was say 50 feet offset from the actual target. Okay. So you would score a direct hit 50 feet away from your target, um, and we we could measure that distance without actually hitting the actual target because that had a bunch of expensive electronics on board that you really didn't want to blow up. 
Um, you want to want to be able to reuse that. Yeah, I used to do a lot of statistics and uh, things of that nature and analysis to determine uh, the accuracy and repeatability of shells coming in. Uh, if, if it was a naval gun or something, something to that effect, uh, shooting at, at one of our targets. So. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Oh, I bet. I bet. Um, you got to watch a lot of things explode, which is always a good time, right? Yeah. So as a young guy, it was it was really interesting <laughs> and hands on work. So it wasn't it wasn't sitting at a desk doing mundane type tasks. It was right. It was hands on going. Wow. So yeah, that's cool. Now, you've also worked in composites at Boeing. Yeah, I've uh, I worked in uh, I won't say for certain, but it was certainly one of the largest composite facilities uh, within Boeing, if not in the world. Yeah. And uh, so we built a lot of uh, composite uh, panels and components early on uh, for the various uh, Boeing aircraft. And yeah. at the time when composites were first coming in, it was uh, smaller wing panels and things like that. Now now we mm-hmm. do entire wings uh, made out of composites. So it's the, the, that whole technology has transitioned from pieces, panels to entire wings now or, or entire fuselage sections. So Yeah. I remember, uh, so when I was uh, studying engineering in like the uh, early 2000s, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but there was a rumor that uh, Boeing was using so much carbon fiber that they was uh, using, you know, was making a shortage in the industry. We were trying to make some things out of carbon fiber and people were like, but there's not that much out there. Boeing's yeah. got it all. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, that, that happens to, to even today. Oh, yeah? With uh, certain materials and, and technologies. Uh, yeah, we because we uh, produce so many aircraft, uh, we tend to drain the world supply in certain uh, materials. So we've got uh, people out there uh, ensuring the uh, supply chain line that uh, we're not going to run out of material. So they they book factories and and uh, and basically mines or uh, mills to produce uh, some of these components for us and. Uh, they're under long-term contract kind of thing to ensure that we uh, continue to make aircraft. So yeah, now it must have been pretty cool to see that uh, composites have made big changes in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what what you've seen change and what uh, what you've noticed? What stood out to you? Um, well, there was a there was a learning curve. Uh, uh, typically, in the aircraft industry, you start out in what I'll call taking baby steps. You don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, certainly, when composites f- first uh, hit hit the industry, uh, no one went out and really tried to build an entire wing or airplane right. of composites. You start out building wing panels, and you uh, develop a level of confidence and and prove mm-hmm. that your structural analysis and things like that are are accurate for for that wing panel. And then you you just over time expand and grow and. Uh, and eventually you end up uh, to like like we are today building wings and, and fuselage barrels but uh, that was a that's been a slow transition over uh, 20 plus years mm-hmm. um, we started out uh, using a lot of Kevlar and uh, fiberglass and then then because uh, graphite was uh, or carbon fiber is uh, was uh, ridiculously expensive at that time and very mm-hmm. rare but uh, now uh, though that's the the material of choice Mm-hmm. And uh, you'll you won't see too many uh, Kevlar panels really at all. It's all all gone to carbon fiber. But uh, so no, the in- the industry has definitely changed, and uh, and uh, yeah, they've gotten a lot fancier with some of the materials and uh, the products. Uh, one being uh, certainly we uh, always with composites are are uh, working on uh, protecting uh, the plane for uh, lightning strike. And static discharge, and so now they weave uh, uh, metal fibers and, and components in, into the uh, into the fiber to uh, uh, provide electrical properties, if you like, for for those uh, characteristics. As oh, well. that's so, really interesting. So carbon fiber is more of an insulator than, say, aluminum, and so if it, it can cause what, what kinds of problems can it cause if uh, if it didn't have that sort of uh, the metal through it. Um, well, you have a hard time with static discharge and, and grounding uh, radios and, and antennas and things like that, as well as uh, now a lot of things are digitally controlled, digital flight controls. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you have to isolate and protect all those systems. And uh, then there's certainly lightning strike. If you don't have a uh, clear discharge path, then uh, the lightning will start to, to do a lot of destruction on your 
on your aircraft. So there's there's lightning paths that are designed, and they do a lot of analysis on on uh, where lightning strikes are are uh, probably probably going to hit the airplane, be it on the nose or radome or or on the uh, wings, and uh, so uh, the the airplane is designed accordingly to transmit that energy and uh, safely discharge it off the airplane, so there's no damage, so or so, little damage. So right, so yeah, you you want to isolate the current from the lightning strike to go around uh, any sort of and away from sensitive components. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, at Boeing, you work in uh, in standards uh, management, standardizing uh, equipment and components. Can you tell me a bit about what uh, why it's important to have these sorts of standards and what kinds of things you're standardizing? Sure. Uh, throughout the industry, uh, and this really is driven from the airlines or the customers, um, they want to use uh, standard parts on their airplanes. So. Uh-huh. Uh, most airlines own uh, planes that are manufactured by Boeing and uh, some by Airbus and Bombardier and Embraer and the former McDonnell Douglas and yeah. uh, and even Lockheed for that matter. And um, when they're doing maintenance on these planes, they don't want to use, uh, uh, for instance, rivets or nuts or something to for for maintaining the plane that uh, um, is required. They want to use a they want to use a standard or a common component. Uh, one part number to to work on all the different planes, yeah. and um, so that's what we call uh, industry standards. There, there's kind of two levels to that. We have we have standards that are that are used on multiple platforms within Boeing uh, across, say, all our our product lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, some 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 standards are used on commercial airplanes. Some are used on commercial airplanes and defense platforms, and some are on commercial airplanes, defense platforms, and uh, spacecraft. <laughs> so uh, there's different uh, categories of standards and, and their usage, but uh, we strive to, to uh, use industry standards uh, that are common throughout the industry. Uh, I, I interface with uh, other other major manufacturers, and uh, we get together and, and write and agree on standards and the requirements and the the design the design requirements uh, for these standards, so that everybody uh, their their requirements are met, and uh, and we provide a standard part um, mm-hmm. to the, to the airlines or whoever uh, is owns an airplane and needs to do maintenance. Yeah, so you're collaborating with other aircraft manufacturers. Uh, this is not something that then Boeing competes with each other on no we we it's a collaborative effort so yeah mm-hmm. it's uh whatever myself from boeing and uh, uh some folks from airbus and lockheed and and uh, all the other companies all sitting in a room and uh discussing who who needs what and uh then we we uh sit down as a as a group and uh and uh, design a standard and, and document the engineering requirements and then we we publish that as a document for everyone to use yeah. Oh, so, what do you find satisfying about this kind of work? It uh, is actually a lot more challenging because you've got uh, inputs uh, from around the world. So you've got, you get you got various people uh, providing comments and opinions on on the work, mm-hmm. and it's uh, it's challenging uh, at times to get a consensus. But uh, at the end of the day, mo- most of the time we're pretty successful at that, and uh, it's uh, I, I always enjoy it because you're meeting people from around the world, and uh, you're exposed to different cultures and languages, and I just I've, I've always found that interesting. I also uh, I, work with all the manufacturers of all these components so uh okay. our our office is uh constantly uh, traveling around the world so yeah. that last week i was in mexico so yeah well so that's that must uh you know sort of uh, scratch that itch a little bit that you had as a child of traveling so much with your family i imagine you also travel a fair amount on your own Yes, I, I love to, to travel uh, as a as a personal hobby, go on vacation and, and see the world. I've also uh, seen the world through uh, work. And uh, yeah, it seems like lately I've traveled so much, around, certainly around North America, that mo- most major cities I can fly into. And I know I don't need a map to even drive around <laughs> those cities. So no, it's been it's been fun and, uh, and a really good experience. So I, re- I enjoy the hands on and getting out out of the office kind of thing as well. So uh, that's also been a, a benefit of the job. So what is it about Boeing that made you want to stick around there so long? Well, Boeing's always been a, a great company. Um, it was certainly a goal, a goal of mine to uh, work for what I consider to be the best company in aerospace. And they've treated me well and provided me with lots of experiences. And uh, so I've really had a, a great career with them. Yeah, the experiences and, and uh, the people I've worked with just 
phenomenal. So now, so you're here for homecoming at the Prescott campus, but you technically graduated from Daytona Beach for a reason that is an interesting marker in Embry Riddle's history. So how did you end up in Daytona for your oh was it only just your last semester? Just my last semester, yes. Well the uh Prescott campus and in, in, in particular engineering, um, and I, I, I forget the exact uh, requirements, so uh, if I misquote something, uh, understand. Prescott uh, being a, a newer campus, uh, the engineering program uh, hadn't obtained its ABET accreditation, and I thought that might be important um, <laughs> in, in getting a job once I graduated, and so I, I kind of wanted the ABET accreditation. Yeah. And I think they required uh, a, a college to have, uh, I think it was 15 graduates out of engineering, and then and then they would, you know, and assuming they had a, a, a respectable uh, engineering program, which Ember Riddle Prescott certainly had, but you needed the 15 graduates to get the ABET. Yeah. Well, there'd only been, I, I, I forget, I'll, I'll, I'll say six or seven people graduate, so. Um, yeah, I, I was were. getting I was getting my final semester and uh, we, I wasn't going to be able to get the ABET accreditation because of that. So uh, I, I, t- I talked to the uh, dean of engineering at the time and uh, Amber Riddle arranged to said, "Hey, why don't you why don't you go to Daytona then for your last semester and uh, pick up the ABET there if you're that concerned about it?" And uh, so that's what I did. Yeah, right or wrong, but it was it, it was a good experience. I, I enjoyed my uh, time at. Uh, Daytona, although it was a quick pit stop per se, but uh, still another another great experience to, to go out and say that I've I've actually attended both campuses and I kind of call Prescott home just because I I, I had the opportunity um, to get to know more people in Prescott just because I was here longer. Within the next year after I did graduate, um, Prescott uh, met the the fifteen. Uh, quota or whatever the magic number was Mm -hmm. and became a credit or a bet accredited and uh so then uh, it was all retroactive anyways but uh yeah yeah very early days in the in the life of the prescott campus so you were you were there right from the get-go now you're an early member of the Prescott chapter of uh, Alpha Eta Rho, the uh, aviation fraternity. Are uh, most of these friends of yours from the fraternity? Yeah, it turns out most are actually yeah. uh, uh, members of the fraternity as well. Um, we were certainly friends. Uh, all lived in the dorms together, and uh, they were all in this fraternity and uh, convinced me to join. And mm-hmm. uh, I kind of hesitated. I remember as an engineering student because, like I say, I, I was always had lots of homework and trying to figure out how to solve differential equations. And yeah. And so I, I had to work hard to get through my classes. Any social time that I had, I, I really enjoyed uh, the fraternity events. So and I certainly made a lot of uh, good friendships that uh, last to, uh, to, to today. So, but it was a, a professional fraternity. Uh, we certainly had uh, a party once or twice a, a semester, but nothing. <laughs> it wasn't uh, 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 major keg drinking uh, type parties, but uh, and m- most of it was professional with things like uh, or events like touring uh, Luke Air Force Base. I think uh, the fraternity went out to Edwards Air Force Base uh, one weekend to see the the space shuttle land. And oh, that's very so, cool. So it was aviation related type events. You're visiting with your fraternity brothers, then? Yes, we're gonna we're gonna hold a uh, social later on today. And, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting uh, all the new chapter members and the existing chapter members, and uh, just getting together and and uh, talking about uh, our common interests. So right, so, right. Yep. <laughs> all right. So we're solidly in orbit. So I have two more questions for you before we go to break. Um, what skills do you think are critical to succeeding in your line of work? I think uh, uh, one one thing that comes to mind is uh, to be successful and and a, a good uh, contributing engineer. I think you need a uh, strong uh, uh, foundation in in the in the basic engineering uh, elements or or topics. Um, you know, you need you need to know some math. You need to know some physics, some electrical and aerodynamics and mm-hmm. propulsion and uh, systems and design and and uh, requirements. Uh, most projects and 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 or uh, that I work on uh, typically involve a, a variety of uh, inputs and, and outputs nothing is just a math problem or or a uh, materials problem it's a combination and and uh, you're you're always looking kind of at the cause and effect so you need you need that a good foundation to 
to uh, to really do a thorough job, in my opinion. And um, the other thing, which is, uh, I guess, more of a soft skill, is uh, I, I think uh, just some good common sense. A lot, a lot of people uh, um, writing computer programs and trying to work to nine decimal places when uh, one decimal place will will suffice. And <laughs> so they, they get they get lost in in the weeds with stuff like that, and and, and good common sense uh, will carry you a long way, I think. So yeah, don't use so. a float when an int will do. Exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think those are the two important uh, skills. Okay. All right. Um, if you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Yeah, that's a tough question. I had a, uh, a great. Cr- I've had a great career, and uh, I I really consider myself fortunate. And quite frankly, I wouldn't change a whole lot. I'm, I've been happy with the the swim path and what I've been exposed to and experienced. And um, I think in my younger years, I certainly and I and still today, I, I, I try I strive to be punctual at for meetings and, and events. And uh, I always tried to be there five or ten minutes early. And uh, I used to stress out a lot uh, if I uh, wasn't going to make it on time, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that used to bother me. But in today's world, world. Uh, I've learned traveling around big cities uh, on freeways and uh, you never know what the traffic situation is going to be. So if you got a nine o'clock meeting, I certainly strive to make nine o'clock. I feel bad if I don't. But uh, nowadays, if there's a car accident, the freeway is closed and you're stuck in traffic, there's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well just relax and and uh, not get all stressed out like I used to. So that's, uh, that, 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 that's really uh, uh, something I've been... Uh, trying to do and, and lower my uh, blood pressure so yeah i hear you i hear you all right well thanks ron and we'll be right back with the splashdown embry riddle's office of alumni engagement hosts regular events at aerospace industry conferences we are coordinating events around the ngpa winter warm-up the hai heli expo the women in aviation conference the space symposium and sun and fun this spring stop by the embry riddle alumni website at alumni.erau.edu <laughs> and scroll down to events to get all the details on what's happening. All right, let's do the splashdown. Uh, what was that one experience that got your heart hooked on aviation or aerospace? I really got into aviation um, through uh, growing up uh, flying on airplanes. My parents like loved to travel around the world. And uh, mm-hmm. so uh, f- from when I was uh, six months old, I, uh, I was the kid wandering around on uh, airplanes and sitting on the pilot's lap up in the flight deck. So yeah, that, that's really what got my uh, interest in aviation. So that's a, uh, yeah, that, that's that kind of experience going up on the flight deck is, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people lament that that's not something you can do anymore more with the the no, flight deck being clocked up no. yeah it's a shame I, that for kids anyways but uh Pilots, I, I've noticed uh, today, are still trying to have that experience by letting them into the into the flight deck uh, pre-flight and and things like that. Mm-hmm. They're 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 trying to do the same same experience, but uh, with nine eleven, yeah, once once they're ready to taxi, they got to lock the doors. So right, right. What's a book that's been important or influential for you? That's another tough question for me because uh, I, I write uh, engineering documents all day long. So I, I publish uh, hundreds and thousands of pages a year. And uh, so at the end of the day, my eyeballs hurt some, <laughs> sometimes from looking at print. And uh, so uh, I, I can't say that I go home and, and uh, want to read a novel, although novels or whatever are interesting, don't get me wrong. But uh, just because of the line of work I'm in, I, I, I see too much text already. But um, so, yeah, I, I, uh, I still try to read av week or aviation okay. week and space technology just to, to keep up with what you know what's going on in the industry kind of thing and, and look at all the neat pictures but uh that's pretty much the extent uh of my uh book reading at, at this point just because of my career and uh, it seems like i always got something on my plate to, sure. to do so yeah yeah well i mean it's good to keep up on trends in the industry for sure for yeah. sure um, so who's your favorite cartoon character? You know, e- even as a kid, I was never big in, into cartoons. A lot okay. of people watch Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner. I never did. Don't ask me why. But um, certainly uh, one cartoon character that does come to mind that I, I, I do chuckle at every once in a while is the Dilbert cartoons. So, oh, uh, sure. Yeah. So uh, I'd, I'd have to say Dilbert. Does a lot of that uh, sort of hit home for you? The- <laughs> at times it does. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we all have our moments. So Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a few Dilberts. That- have uh, have closely connected with in the past. Um, 
So if uh, you could go to the Olympics and compete in any sport, what would you choose? Ha, ah, that's an easy one for me. Um, I would have to say curling. Yeah. So I, uh, I've actually uh, was on the Washington State Curling Association was her title, but uh, uh, which feeds up into the uh, United States Curling Association, which looks after the uh, Olympics and uh, supporting uh, Olympic curling. Okay. For the United States, so I I, I was on that uh, organization, but I'm also a, was a competitive curler. I'll probably pick it up again uh, when, once I have a little more time in retirement, and uh, there's still the opportunity, I think, for me to make the Olympics in curling. But uh, yeah. So uh, watch out for me down the road. There we go. There we go. I'm not, I don't remember where uh, the next Olympics is going to be, but I'll keep an eye for you. Well, it probably won't be the next Olympics. <laughs> no, no, Maybe the one after that. Okay. But, uh, All right. No, I've, I've certainly, uh, um, I, I think it was back during the days of uh, when, when Salt Lake City was hosting the uh, curling. Uh, hmm. A lot of the world uh, teams that uh, were going to compete in that Olympics actually uh, spent a month or two in Seattle, Washington where we have a curling club, oh. and uh, they were looking for practice games. So uh, I, I had the opportunity to play several of the teams that uh, actually competed in the Olympics. So Yeah, how did you do? Uh, I held my own. Okay, so. rock and roll, rock and roll. All right. I'm not going to say I won every game, but I, 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 I won a few. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's good. You're able to, you know, hold your own against uh, Olympians. Excellent. Yeah. So there's, there's a chance that we'll see you in eight years. There's a chance. All right, yeah. all right. Now, if you could live for a week as any person in history, who would it be? Uh, certainly, uh, I would have liked to have been in the in the f- as the chief pilot or whatever at the start of the seven four seven program, and had the opportunity to fly the the four seven for the first time. Yeah. Um, other things that come to mind is you know Chuck being able to fly with Chuck Yeager or something when he was doing all his great work out at Edwards Air Force Base, yeah. or one of the space shuttle commanders on on some of their flights. So. Unfortunately, I haven't had that opportunity, but uh, uh, it would uh, have been uh, interesting to have worked on some of those major uh, programs that uh, I think were uh, were quite notable in aviation history. So That's great. That's great. All right. Well, thanks very much, Ron, for joining us for the Talent Talks podcast. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Wonderful to have you here on the Prescott campus as well. Glad you're able to make it back again. Yep. I enjoy, enjoy every time I come here, and I'm always amazed at all the changes and... and uh, and hopefully uh, everything will continue forward in a, in the in the good way that Ember Riddle runs. So great, great. All right, this episode of Talent Talks is a production of the Embry Riddle Office of Philanthropy and Alumni Engagement and the students at Wicked Radio. We're coming at you from uh, one of my colleagues' offices here at the Prescott campus, since I'm usually based out of Daytona Beach. Uh, this episode was recorded uh, by me and edited by the students at Wicked. Michelle Day is our program manager. Edmund Odarte is executive director of alumni engagement, and Tony Brown is executive director of communications. Please send us your thoughts about our show. Visit alumni.erau.edu slash podcast and click the feedback link. I read all your messages. Thanks for downloading us and we'll see you next time.